Hello, Victoria. My name is Mike Lilly. I'm an activist and local resident, and I'm often reminded of how lucky I am to live in such a beautiful city. However, I am a firm believer in the notion that those who don't rigorously defend their freedom will incrementally lose it. That is why I'm here today to present to you a topic that is both controversial and largely unheard of. It is known as stratospheric aerosol geoengineering, often simply called chemtrails. Now the notion of a chemtrail conspiracy has long been ridiculed by the mainstream, despite the overwhelming visual evidence in the skies and the increasing prominence of the topic in many publications. I started doing research and what I uncovered was highly disturbing. My interest in chemtrails predates my full comprehension of the phenomenon. As a kid, I remember being fascinated by the milky white smoke billowing out of passing jets overhead. I noticed that sometimes these trails would disappear like a normal contrail, but other times they would linger and exhibit distinctly different characteristics. Then I began hearing rumors regarding aerial aerosol programs being carried out by the Canadian military. Geoengineering is human intervention in the Earth's climate and weather systems. This can be accomplished in a variety of ways. One can find dozens of patents pertaining to weather modification simply by searching Google. Indeed, the technology has existed for decades. One such method involves releasing aerosols from jet aircraft into the stratosphere. This is what's known as stratospheric aerosol geoengineering, and many credible people allege that it is responsible for these persistent and lingering contrails. The stated purpose of these programs is to cool the planet in the face of rampant, imminent global warming. Climate extremists such as David Keith of the University of Calgary advocate spraying aluminum oxide to reflect solar radiation back into space. Obviously, there are several problems with this. For one, aluminum is a toxic and highly reactive metal. Overexposure can result in adverse human health effects. It is even thought to be linked to Alzheimer's disease. It is damaging to ecosystems as well because it is conducive to altered pH levels in soil. In my mind, the environmental pretext was hard to justify because clearly geoengineering is not getting to the root of our problems. It is a patch job with many side effects. This led me to question the good intentions of the program. If the spraying we see in Victoria's skies is for our own good and our leaders are saving the earth by re-engineering it, then why has it not been disclosed publicly? Why is it talked about in science magazines and even a recent issue of Time magazine, but when confronted, our political leaders deny having any knowledge? Whether it was being used for political, military, or corporate gain, I knew I had to get to the bottom of it. This is what got me into activism. After all, what could be more important than the air we breathe? I started Victoria Geoengineering Watch, and began networking with several local activists, who you will be hearing from shortly. In the meantime, I want to direct your attention towards an interview conducted by Jack Etkin, host of the ICTV show Face to Face. He will be interviewing Michael J. Murphy, the filmmaker behind the viral chemtrail documentary What in the World Are They Spraying? Thanks for tuning in. I hope you enjoy the show with an open mind. Without further ado, here is the Michael J. Murphy interview. My name is Jack Etkin. I'm talking to Michael Murphy. Uh, Michael, why don't you introduce yourself and, uh, and introduce the subject? All right. Well, uh, well thanks for covering this, uh, this most dire issue uh, called the chemtrail issue, scientifically called geoengineering. I am the, uh, the co-producer and originator of uh, the groundbreaking documentary uh, called What in the World Are They Sprain, which is a an investigation into these programs. Okay, now you use the word geoengineering. I don't know what that is, and I'm sure a lot of the people who are listening also don't. Um, what exactly is going on? Well, uh, the word geoengineering is commonly referred to people in the public as uh, chemtrails, but scientifically, uh, again, it's called stratospheric aerosol geoengineering. And geoengineering is uh, defined as the artificial modification of the Earth's climate. So there are uh, corporations, government, scientists working together uh, with the goal of uh, altering our climate. 
specifically, uh, what we cover in the film and what many people refer to as chemtrails, uh, again, it's called uh, climate uh, remediation, solar radiation management, uh, and probably the most common term, uh, again, is, uh, is stratospheric aerosol geoengineering. And uh, geoengineers are proposing spraying 10 to 20 million tons of uh, toxic aluminum oxide and other substances, other toxins, into our sky for what they say is the stated goal of uh, cooling the planet. Um, however, a number of studies indicate that putting aerosols in our sky, is, uh, as in a number of geoengineering uh, models, uh, will create a temporary cooling, but in overall warming, because those aerosols actually act as a blanket. And we've seen nighttime highs uh, really increase in the past 10 to 15 years, and that's about when most people believe that these programs have been uh, escalated and put into full-scale deployment. Well, you know, to me, the most amazing thing about everything you're saying is that uh, and, uh, nobody, nobody, this is never, ever mentioned in Canada. It's not mentioned by our politicians. It's not mentioned by the media. And yet, according to you, somebody is actually talking about it, making plans, and they are doing it, and we don't even know that it's happening. It's simply never mentioned. Well, you, you know, if you're in the alternative media, uh, it absolutely is discussed. And actually, David Keith, who as a scientist at the University of Calgary, is uh, considered to be one of the top geoengineers uh, in the world. But we have to realize, and hopefully we'll talk in the interview about some of the agendas truly behind these programs. These programs benefit large multinational corporations. Um, some of the agendas, uh, which there are many, include weather control. Controlling the weather consolidates an enormous amount of political and monetary power into the hands of a few. So getting into the mainstream media, if you look at some of the advertisers on ABC, CBS, NBC, uh, need I say more, it's military, industrial, uh, complex, uh, large multinational corporations, the very corporations who benefit from these damaging programs. Can you tell me exactly what they are doing? Because we, I see them over Victoria frequently. Maybe you can just describe, uh, you know, over any typical Canadian or, or North American city, what people are seeing and, and what it is and what they're doing and, and link the why into it as well. Well, I think that's a great question. And uh, typically now uh, in the sky, this is a recent phenomenon, but what we're seeing on a regular basis are these very long trails behind airplanes, uh, very different from a contrail or condensation trail which usually dissipates in about four to five seconds. But what we're seeing on a regular basis now, uh, again, are these long trails that do not dissipate. They actually spread out and block the sun. Um, again, this is what is uh, the stated goal of a number of stratospheric aerosol geoengineering programs. Um, while they deny that these programs have been uh, implemented, there's evidence, which we'll get into, uh, that, that really proves that these programs have been started. But what we see in the sky, again, are these long trails. And typically on four to five days a week in most North American cities and in places around the world, we'll see our sun blocked out about 1 o'clock or 2 o'clock. Um, but really what my investigation was in was uh, in the toxicity and the fallout of these programs. And since we released What in the World Are They Spraying, uh, hundreds of people from around the world have been testing rain. Rain's a very good indicator of atmospheric contamination and what they're finding, and it's exactly what we found in the film, was what many are calling this, uh, this chemtrail geoengineering footprint of aluminum, barium, and strontium. So uh, again, what we see in the sky uh, matches what geoengineers state that they urgently want to do, which is disperse aerosols out of airplanes. And uh, what we see in terms of contamination, which uh, is showing up around the world, it matches geoengineers' models of spraying aluminum and, and other substances into our sky, and there's actually uh, been a number of, uh, of patents, uh, devices that have been designed to specifically spray aluminum oxide and other, uh, other toxins out of airplanes for the state of goal, again, of cooling the planet. But okay, so if we in Victoria then happen to uh, go out any time, including today, because the stuff has already been being sprayed for years, so it's in our soil, it's in our water. And so you're saying that here in Victoria, if we began to test for aluminum, barium and strontium, we would find it. And we would find it because it's being dropped out of airplanes over our heads. The contamination is there and it's everywhere. And uh, aluminum, barium, strontium, other uh, metals that were proposed 
uh, and are being sprayed by geoengineers are very toxic to our ecosystem. As a matter of fact, uh, specifically, aluminum oxide will change the pH of soil. So in Northern California, we, uh, we actually spoke with Francis Mangles. He's a retired USDA biologist. And uh, several years ago, they started noticing that the forests were collapsing, natural organic foods were not growing. So some of the scientists, they got together and they said, what's, uh, what's going on here? Let's start figuring out, you know, why things are dying. And what they found was really shocking. They found that the pH of the soil in that area, which is typically acidic, acidic was changing to alkaline. And we're talking about very significant changes anywhere between 10 to 12 times the normal alkalinity. Uh, basic science tells us that when uh, the soil pH changes that drastically, plant life that requires an acidic soil will die. Exactly what was happening. So they began to test further uh, in starting to do uh, rain tests. And as stated earlier, that's a very good uh, indicator of atmospheric contamination. And what they found, uh, again, massive amounts of aluminum, barium, and strontium. Now, in some cases, these tests have escalated just in a seven-year period, 50,000 percentage points, uh, as we begin to see uh, our blue skies go away. So uh, again, what we uh, are finding in the rain matches geoengineers' plans exactly. It matches a number of patents, and it's very destructive uh, to our ecosystem um, and to human health as well. Aluminum-related illnesses uh, have gone through the roof. Uh, there's a group in Mojave County, uh, a number of people, and I think the number is 26, decided to get their blood tested. Uh, what they found was deeply shocking. 22 out of those people had uh, just massive amounts of barium uh, in their blood. A number of them had uh, a large numbers uh, of aluminum as well. We actually covered that uh, in the first film, but the barium levels in 22 out of those people were uh, considered to be uh, 1,000 times the level considered to be elevated. I mean, these numbers are just through the roof. So uh, the contamination is there. It's showing up. In, uh, in tests uh, around the world. As a result, we see ecosystem die off, and we're seeing aluminum, barium, uh, and other related illnesses uh, going through the roof. For instance, respiratory mortality has gone from number eight down to number three uh, in just the past seven years. So uh, it's a deep concern uh, of ours, but we know that certain corporations uh, gain uh, a tremendous amount of not only financial, but political and in monetary leverage uh, through these programs. So what is the true agenda? Hopefully we'll get into that. Well, what is the true agenda? Well, that, uh, that brings me into my, my next film. In the first film, uh, over 10 million people have had uh, an opportunity to see it. As a result, we have worldwide movements uh, that have been started. I'm actually here uh, in Maui. Uh, it's a tough job, but somebody has to do it. And uh, we're working on the Clean Sky Ordinance, which is an ordinance that will ban uh, geoengineering programs on and around the county uh, of Maui. But here, uh, I've had an opportunity to, to interview a lot of local organic farmers. And uh, so far, I've spoken to many who have seen, uh, at the lowest level, 65% decline in their ability to grow natural organic foods. Uh, and at the high level, a 75% decline in the past 10 years. What these programs do, they sterilize our soil. Um, but that doesn't make any sense. Jack, it didn't to me until I looked into it further. And I found out that there are corporations, genetically modified seed corporations, that want to genetically modify everything that grows. So here's what's happening. Companies like Monsanto, other GMO seed companies, through the destruction of natural farms and natural foods, then come in with their patented, and there are patents, for stress-resistant seeds. Uh, and there's even an aluminum-resistant seed. So we know, without a doubt, our, our soils are being contaminated. They're being stressed and essentially sterilized. Now there are seeds that have been developed by corporations that can grow in this new environment. So we touched about that specific issue in the film, but I believe the number one uh, agenda behind these programs is weather control. And I think most people uh, realize that our weather has been way out of balance. Uh, geoengineers are very open uh, about their programs, uh, changing weather patterns, um, uh, creating droughts in certain areas, floods in other areas, and even depleting our ozone. Uh, NOAA just did a report that our ozone has had significant depletion. That is because we are being sprayed. But getting back to the weather control, 
Uh, weather control is very profitable uh, for certain corporations, and if you create droughts in certain areas and, and heavy uh, rainfall in other areas, it gives uh, certain corporations an advantage not only with modified seeds, uh, but with other corporations that can come in and uh, benefit politically, monetarily, and uh, it's what it is, it's a consolidation of power into the hands of the few. So if you control the weather, you can control every food supply and every political system, and it's very effective about, again, consolidating mo monetary and political power into the hands of the few. That's what these programs enable, and geoengineer David Keith uh, made a statement about a year and a half ago. He said, geoengineering gives man godlike power. Well, if you control the weather, you control the planet. You have godlike power. And that's what we believe the number one agenda is. Uh, the next film, I interviewed meteorologist Scott Stevens. Uh, he was a weatherman for 20 years uh, in the corporate mainstream media. Uh, and he was very open. He's been studying this for a number of years. Um, the aerosols are needed. Uh, for these entities to control our weather. There's no question about it. I've spoken and backed up what he has said with a number of uh, aerosol uh, professors. I went to an aerosol research uh, conference in, in October. So we're going we're gonna to bring this message, uh, specifically why uh, they're doing this. And, and again, uh, as my co-producer in the first film said, uh, he said, if you just follow the money, uh, you will get the answer, and that's what we're doing. This is about corporatization of natural systems. It sounds absolutely, you know, I, I wish I could say, no, the corporations wouldn't do anything like that, but actually I, I've never seen anything yet they wouldn't do um, in order to make a profit. Um, have you ever heard of anything called the Canada Weather Modification Act? It, you know, it's, it rings a bell, and, and uh, I, I'm glad that you brought it up. What we're talking about goes greater than weather modification, and weather modification is it's, uh, it's creating rain in certain areas, and they use government-rated uh, substances such as silver iodide, dry ice they can put on clouds and make it rain in certain areas. It's very effective for, like, a ski resort or certain industries. What they're doing today, according to meteorologist Scott Stevens, he said the weather modification is very similar to, uh, to trying to plow like a, like a thousand acre farm with one mule, you know, in, in one plow. Uh, he said today we have uh, the ability to do continent size programs, and, and that brings me into what they're doing. So the number one ingredient that we're finding, and it's in geoengineers' proposals, is aluminum, and geoengineers say that aluminum is reflective, so it re will reflect sunlight back into space. But what we're finding, uh, and I interviewed uh, Dr. Nick Baggage, who is a uh, considered to be the number one expert on HARP. What we're finding is aluminum is a very effective conductor in our sky, and by dispersing it into our sky through the HARP system and other technologies, they have the ability to heat up parts of our atmosphere. What does a heating up atmosphere do? It lifts. And when an atmosphere lifts, it creates a low pressure vacuum and it enables these entities to steer storms. So when you see the heavy strain, and you will, folks, when you look up, you can usually predict that it will rain in the next 24 to 72 hours uh, because that's what they're doing. They usually engineer about 500 to 1,000 miles uh, ahead of a storm. And then other aerosols that they're spraying, spraying they also seed clouds. And, in aerosols, and I backed this up with a number of, uh, of experts, aerosols do affect the way that clouds uh, condense and nucleate. So with various aerosols, you can actually dissipate a storm uh, and move moisture to another area, or you can actually uh, accentuate the rain in certain areas. So through these programs, you can expect, no question about it, and geoengineers will back this up, you can expect to see storms that are several standard deviations uh, above what would consider to be normal. So uh, what we're finding is just mind-blowing. And uh, again, controlling the weather, corporatization of our weather gives corporations an enormous amount of power. It's also used by our military. We covered that in the first film. And if, if, you, can, if you can move rain away from a certain area and, and create a food shortage of some type, um, well, you can speculate in food, which is going on constantly as well. When you go to politicians with these issues, 
is there any response? Well, there has been more at the local level, and uh, that's why we're working here in Maui County. We have a sponsor for this bill. Uh, people here realize there's a mass awakening. We, we hit a street campaign. We handed out thousands of DVDs of my first film, What in the World Are They Spraying? As a result, the county's uh, awakened to this, and now people are taking action. The politicians are listening. Uh, we have also had counties in other areas, a couple counties in other areas in the United States, um, who are addressing this moving forward with similar ordinances. At the upper level, at Congress and the Senate, and we ended what in the world are they spraying in Washington, D.C. Uh, <laughs> there's no question that uh, our elected officials are serving the interests of the corporations. So it's a very, uh, even though there have been a number of congressional hearings on this issue, it's a taboo topic. Uh, our senators, our members of Congress, want to run away from it, but I can urge people, and I want to urge people to be persistent with this. Do it in a nice, calm manner when you approach them. It's hard to not get angry when you believe that they're covering something up that's harming you, harming your family, uh, you know, harming your land, and perhaps an agenda to destroy your land so that it can be corporatized and taken over by certain governments, but it's important that you address it in, in a very uh, calm, effective, and, and prudent way. And, and when we've done that, we've actually had uh, a lot of action. So no question about it, geoengineers are putting forth and proposing legislation, and they're calling for global government to uh, regulate these programs. They're also now, because of the Arctic ice, uh, according to them, is melting so quickly, geoengineers are calling for emergency uh, immediate disbursement of, uh, of these aerosols into the atmosphere above the Arctic. There's evidence that shows they started about 40 years ago. But what they're doing, they're selling these programs to the public, stating that they have to do this to save us from the supposed threat uh, of global warming. Well, that has nothing to do with it. We've, we have proof that these programs in the long run warm the planet. So what is it about? It's about money and power. It's about control. And these programs allow these entities to do that. But how do you sell programs that are harmful uh, to members of countries, citizens of the world, uh, without deception? The bottom line is you can't. So what they're doing, they're creating this, this uh, disaster scenario if they don't put these toxins in our sky, stating we're doing this for your own good. It's going to hurt many of you. There are going to be droughts in Africa and Asia. As a result, people are going to starve, but it's for the greater good of humanity. Well, no. This is about money and power, and you cannot sell money and power when you're hurting somebody. So they're using the fear ticket, uh, but that's why we're here. We're here to bring truth to this issue so that people wake up, they stand up, and we create the future that we want. You know, Jack, uh, I have to express this. I'm in the rainforest on Maui, Hawaii. I've been here for one month. It has rained continuously. I am looking at things all around the island dying. Now, I spoke with people around the world, and I've heard the same scenario. Things are dying. If it's in the rain, bottom line is it's in the soil. Plant life, because the, the aluminum has just been coming down in massive amounts, All most plant life will shut down its root system when bioavailable aluminum is introduced and they die a very slow death. As a result, we are not getting the yields. People are concerned that they will not be able to live off of the land. Many of the native Hawaiians here uh, that do and, and for generations have been dependent off of the land now are saying, I, you know, what are we going to do? Stuff is dying. So this is, God, I honestly do not believe that we have had a greater threat to the planet or will, you know, short of nuclear fallout. What could be more important than breathing oxygen? They are destroying what gives us oxygen. What could be more important waking up and not walking out the door and breathing up a uh, lungful of heavy metals? We've seen aluminum-related illnesses, barium-related illnesses go through the roof. These programs are so toxic. They're slow but very insidious and I'm looking at the death, and it's not good. So uh, on, on a lighter note, um, I hope that my message is never perceived as a message of fear, but a message of faith, and, and knowing that if we address this, because the human, the power of the, the spoken word, the human spirit is so powerful, 
if we exercise the authority that we have over this earth, and, and we are stewards of this earth, mm -hmm. and those of us who are aware of this and become educated about this have an obligation uh, to address this. Um, and if so, we must address it in faith, knowing that standing up collectively, saying, no, we will not be sprayed, we will not allow you to do this to our planet, we have the ability to stop these programs and allow the earth to heal and give our children the future that we once had. Michael Murphy, thank you very much. Could a strange substance found by a Southwest Arkansas man be part of a government test? Well, that's the question at the heart of a phenomenon called chemtrails, now getting widespread attention. Well, they say the government is dumping chemicals on us to control or manipulate the weather. And they say the unusual looking jet trails in the sky are actually chemical laden chemtrails. People say the government is up there in airplanes spraying all kinds of chemicals to change or manipulate the weather, leaving what you see there, and they call that a chemtrail. So when I look up there and I think are contrails, you're telling me our chemtrail. Yes, that a contrail would be dissipated by now. And it's interesting, Dale and Christina, this is of interest not just in this country, but uh, European countries and frankly all over the world. A lot of folks interested in it. Well, Dave, you mentioned that climatologists and others who study the atmosphere believe that they'd be able to surely spot any kind of signs of an ominous plot. Our journey started in San Diego, California, where thousands of scientists, engineers, policymakers, and journalists gathered for the American Association for the Advancement of Science Conference. One of the topics was the artificial manipulation of the Earth's climate, also called geoengineering. During the meeting, scientists spoke about the plausibility of implementing geoengineering campaigns throughout the world under the guise of preventing global warming. One widely accepted theory was to block the sun by spraying something into the atmosphere. When they were asked about existing aerosol programs, they stated clearly that no such programs have ever been implemented. But strangely, these proposals sounded exactly like what people around the world are claiming is already happening. When I found out that the American Association for the Advancement of Science was going to be held down here and the main body of uh, topics would be on geoengineering, I had to come. I, I had to be in on this. I had to hear what these top climate change scientists had to say. Uh, and as the other question about you know, chemtrails and whether geoengineering is being deployed right now without uh, our knowledge, uh, I don't have any personal insight into that um, other than to say that I worked in government at uh, you know, pretty high levels in the White House and in, in, uh, at state government. You know, I'm personally skeptical of that. Um, uh, but obviously, you never know what you don't know. Chemtrails. On the internet, they are cited as proof of the government creating clouds to combat global warming. They claim the American government, with the secret approval of the national government, is covertly using jet aircraft to spray population centers with aluminium, with barium, and with strontium, so as to reduce people's humidity and reduce the global population. I'm always a little bit suspicious because the government doesn't seem that um, capable to do something on such a large scale. You know? That is not rain, that is not snow. Believe it or not, military aircraft flying through the region is dropping chaff. Small bits of aluminum, sometimes it's made of plastic or uh, even uh, telesized paper products, but it's used as an anti-radar issue and obviously they're up there practicing. Now they won't confirm that, but I was in the Marine Corps for many years and I'll tell you right now, that's what it is. And what happens here, military jets, some come out of Key West Air Force Base and they move off into the atmosphere and they drop my large strips. Some could be a little wider, some are small glass fibers that are coated in aluminum. And what the Air Force does is they take their military jets and they dump these out of the aircraft, they fall into the atmosphere, and some take as much to a day to fall down. This is inevitably military or something going on. The government, the Air Force, you see this kind of a pattern like this. You can rest assured there's something going on. They're actually little bitty magnetic and little bitty strips of whether it's aluminum. Well, it's a nuisance to you and I to determine what's real and what's not, but it looks like it is a life-saving operation there from the military. The apparent motive behind this conspiracy theory is one world government. Oh. Order, order, I cannot hear. Mr. Speaker, I want to assure the House that both my ministry and my colleague, the Minister of Health, who have received correspondence on this issue, that this conspiracy theory does not have an iota of truth 
and that the trails observed from aircraft simply come from jet engines. <laughs> Question number nine of order. And I think what an appalling example it is of the new foreign affairs spokesperson for the Labour Party that she's spreading order. conspiracy order. theories order. about the United order. States government. I think the House has heard sufficient. It is called geoengineering, fighting global warming by putting a chemical dust in the atmosphere and reflecting harmful radiation back into space. We take geoengineering to mean deliberate, large-scale intervention in the Earth system. There are a variety of schemes that have been discussed for geoengineering. A classic example is uh, injecting reflecting particles into Earth orbit. Nevertheless, there might be some good reasons to think about alumina. It turns out, first of all, there's been a lot of work on the environmental consequences of alumina in the stratosphere. The big deal really is that alumina has four times the volumetric rate of forcing it for small particles, as does sulfur. And that means you have four times less surface area for the same rate of forcing. And this is a much bigger deal. You have roughly 16 times less the coagulation rate. And that's the thing that really drives removal. So you could get away, we think, with much smaller mass fluxes. So that's why we see things like in the uh, use, use aircraft patent from 89, they talk about aluminum. And that's why we're seeing in the surface water samples aluminum. And here's David Keith saying uh, that aluminum has four times the reflective uh, volume surface area. So they'd like us to think that we're talking about sulfur, but here they slipped up and let it out that uh, aluminum is four times better to achieving their ends, and it sounds like it's kind of the one they don't want us to know the effects of. Mm. The little picture is from a nanofabrication study, which shows you can make very high quality, and do this in just a jet in a very simple way, make high quality alumina particles just by spraying alumina vapor out, which oxidizes. So it's certainly in principle possible to do that, and there's a big literature that's already looked at that. And you could do that by either building new versions of these aircraft or even re-engineering existing aircraft. So there's some ideas of that. So you go to an engineering firm and you want this done. They don't say this is hard or unusual. They say, okay, yes, we could do it. Aerosol geoengineering looks like it is so cheap that the cost is basically not going to be an issue. That means that implementation decisions will be risk-to-risk -risk decisions. The risk of doing it against the risk of not doing it. And it makes the problem of how we govern it fundamentally harder and different and normal. So I've told you that it's cheap to deliver materials to the stratosphere, and I'm convinced that's true. I don't think that will change. But I think the more we do research, the less easy this will look, the more complicated the environmental effects will look. And that's a good thing, because right now it looks too easy. So I think that if we do more research, we're likely to find out that it's harder and more complicated than we thought, and that the side effects are harder to manage. And that's a healthy outcome that will make it easier to do the management. Of course, the opposite reaction is possible. It's an empirical question how people will actually react to knowledge about this. Another reaction is to say, if these crazy scientists are so concerned about putting CO2 in the atmosphere, they want to think about these things, then that might actually mean we should be more serious about the risks of CO2 in the atmosphere. And by the way, it's not really a moral hazard. It's more like free riding on our grandkids. And by the way, it's not really a moral hazard. It's more like free riding on our grandkids. Um, numerous air quality studies, uh, including from uh, CARB, California Air Quality Resource Board, have named submicron sized particulates as being particularly harmful for human respiration. Through all the discussions today, uh, I have not heard any mention of this fallout, and has, has this been studied, and also the effects of a highly reactive metal like aluminum on toxifying soils and waters? The question is, what would be the effects of these materials on human health if they came down into the stratosphere, in, uh, in, in particular, uh, small particles and aluminum. So, so the, the collaborators of mine working on the aerosol scheme are actually folks from Carnegie Mellon who focused on human health impacts. And while we haven't published it, that was the very first thing we did, was do the order of magnitude calculation in a level pencil and paper, but with an expert on human health impacts about whether there could be an issue. And, and for aluminum or other particles, there are a lot of toxicological things that need to get looked at seriously. But if you're just thinking about the sheer number of particles and the hu human health impacts of small particles, the answer is, well, we haven't published it. That was the first thing we looked at with some of the leading experts who do uh, epidemiological research on human health impacts, and it's not even close Can to I being an issue. Clarify, so 10 megatons of aluminum dumped into the, the uh, atmosphere would have no human health impacts. So, so let me be more careful here. We're to separate out the toxicological. So the alumina, we've only begun to research and published nothing. The alumina, we've only begun to research and published nothing.
Dane looked at him and he said, so you're telling me that spraying 10 to 20 megatons of aluminum, as you said, would have no human health effects? He took a deep breath and he swallowed and he said, let me be more careful here. We haven't done anything serious on Illumina and so there could be something terrible that we'll find tomorrow we haven't looked at. It. And that for me, that was the whole main point of, of what is, is going to be coming out to the public. It's, it's the damaging effects of aluminum that are being found around the world in massive amounts. Here's David Keith confronted on this very issue and he, he looked, you know, at that point like, like they just let the cat out of the bag. Mm -hmm. We haven't done anything serious on Illumina, and so there could be something terrible that we'll find tomorrow we haven't looked at. It. They're proceeding because they have an agenda that's separate from trying to thwart this crisis of global warming. You know, there's, there's obviously several other objectives, whether it's depopulation, control, uh, weapons aspects, communications aspects, all kinds of things, you know, wild cards that we know nothing about. We don't really know, and I'm not going to attempt to speculate on exactly what the agendas are, but we can see clearly they're not, uh, they're not, the agendas are not benefiting mankind. You know, it's benefiting the agenda of the elite. And so I think the question is how do you draw the line between some activity uh, that is allowed and doesn't need global governance and activities that do require global governance. Dr. John Holdren has agreed to serve as Assistant to the President for Science and Technology and Director of the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. I look forward to his wise counsel in the years ahead. My personal opinion is that we have to keep geoengineering on the table. We have to look at it very carefully because we might get desperate enough to want to use it. So what would we do if in year 2040 or 2060 there's a severe climate crisis, say widespread famines or Greenland sliding suddenly into the ocean, that the only plausible way in which we could start the earth cooling this century is to directly intervene in the climate system, say by putting particles in the stratosphere. We do stuff in the stratosphere all the time, of course, and so it's not as though the stratosphere is absolutely pristine. But you don't want to have people going off and doing things that involve large radiative forcings or go on for extended periods or for that matter provide lots of reactive surfaces that could uh, result in significant ozone destruction. You know, maybe I'm putting a particle into the atmosphere because I'm trying to make money or maybe I'm putting a particle into the atmosphere because I'm engaging in scientific research and trying to understand cloud physics or maybe I'm putting this particle into the atmosphere because I'm trying to make it rain uh, locally uh, to, to see the cloud and get more snow on our ski slopes. And this obviously raises all kinds of questions. It's hugely risky. Uh, it will likely negatively impact some people, but we might find ourselves in a situation where those risks seem worth taking. One of the things that really shocked me was uh, in, one, in one of the breakouts they had the benefits of these programs and then the risks. Now the benefits, the one thing that was stated was the uh, just cooling the planet. You know, some of the risks were ozone depletion, um, droughts in Africa and Asia. I gotta tell you, uh, I came away from this experience after listening to these scientists for four days, four days of symposiums, really concerned because it's clear now that they are justifying, rationalizing, and looking to uh, legitimize some really, really horrible impacts, further impacts on our environment. And they're basically formulating the sales strategy and the implementation and oversight strategy and the funding strategy. After San Diego, I was shocked by the programs that had been proposed. I decided to write about it. That night when I finished, I sent the article to an online publication with my email address attached. When I woke up the next morning, my inbox was flooded with responses from around the world. Why? Because I had just broken the story on aluminum in geoengineering models, which I had no clue at the time that very few people knew about. Now this metal, aluminum, is being found in massive quantities way above normal levels all over in rain, in soil, and in snow. After that, the calls started pouring in from people who were desperate for someone to investigate. That was the fuel that started the film. 
Before we started filming, we had the opportunity to sit down with one of our favorite authors and documentarians, G. Edward Griffin, to find out what he knew about the subject. I'd like to talk uh, for a minute about an issue that's getting more and more attention. That's the issue which scientifically is called stratospheric aerosol geoengineering, also called the chemtrail issue. I'm very aware of the chemtrail versus contrail controversy. As far as I'm concerned, it's an open and shut case. I have been watching the development of uh, jet travel from its very beginning. I used to live near the Los Angeles airport. Remember when the first jets came in and landed, man, they made a big noise. We never heard a noise like that before. And we used to go down and sit at the end of the runway and watch these jets come in and, and take off uh, because it was a novel experience. I've been watching jets all my life and I know about jet contrails. I've watched them. They, they're vaporized uh, moisture, ice crystals, and they get out there in the atmosphere and then they uh, effervesce and evaporate and then disappear and you can see them. The plane moves along and the little white trail follows right behind it and usually about 10 or 20 lengths of the plane or thereabouts and then it's gone. And you can still see them that way, by the way, once in a while. So there goes a contrail. These other things we're talking about are not at all the same phenomena at all. These planes go by and they billow out this white smoke and it covers the sky from horizon to horizon. It doesn't dissipate at all. And they crisscross each other and you see this thing cover the sky and turn it milky and then people start having trouble breathing and then you hear stories about the, the aluminum and barium deposits that they're picking up and the residue. And you put it all together and I don't see how anybody who's got their eyes open and their mind open can come to any other conclusion but that somebody is spending a lot of money and effort to spray the planet. The question is, why? I have my own theories, but I hope that there will be some good investigative reporters go out there and get us the answer. I know that whenever it's finally discovered, and it will be, the people who are doing it will undoubtedly say, oh, well, we did it for you folks. It's for the greater good of the greater number. It's for the society. It's probably to prevent global warming, or maybe it's to inoculate people against some kind of a dreaded biological attack. We can't go around shooting everybody in the arm, but we can spray them and save their lives. You see how good we are? We're doing it for the benefit of society. I know they're going to, whatever it is, they're going to say it was for your good, but mine. Think if we had the ability to steer hurricanes, and the hurricane was going to slam into New Orleans. And let's say you could steer it so it would hit Mississippi instead. Where for a hundred, that means I would be willing to uh, more or less kill 18 Mississippians to save 1,800 New Orleanians. Uh, you know that uh, you know. Are, and if you do that knowingly, are you murdering those hundred people? And there's all kinds of equity issues there. Now, also, we might be wrong about our steering, and and if we didn't do the research right, maybe our steering would intensify Katrina and even kill more people in, in New Orleans. And so this question of how do you develop the confidence to know that your in intervention will reduce overall damage, and then how do you deal with the understanding that you might be damaging some people who wouldn't have been damaged before while saving people overall? The spraying appears to be mostly in NATO countries. I've seen it here in the United States, I've seen it in England, I've seen it in Scotland, uh, I've seen it in Canada, and I've had reports uh, from people who live in France. There's a grouping, there's a political grouping here of some sort, it's international in scope. It's not just an American phenomenon, it's international. And um, anybody that wants to investigate that, I think has to take that fact into consideration. They're gonna find a political grouping and a political motive here. But in my humble opinion, it's not in your good or mine at all. I don't know what it is, but we'll soon find out.
Well, geoengineering is the idea and practice of humans doing things actively to affect and change the environment and climate for all sorts of ideas and theories. Some forms of geoengineering include dumping tons of iron into the ocean to create huge phytoplankton blooms or having giant ships with smokestacks push sulfur dioxide into the atmosphere to block out solar radiation and sunshine. Others are quite beneficial. Uh, there are forms of geoengineering such as large scale tree planting efforts. Uh, the stratospheric aerosol spraying of oxidized metals is one form of geoengineering as well. It's known to many of us as chemtrails. Geoengineering in this aspect is chemtrails. It's the practice, I believe, of spraying oxidized particles of aluminum, barium, and strontium into the upper atmosphere. There are quite a few patents that exist today that are evidence that someone is thinking about aerosol spraying and weather manipulation. Just to name a few U.S. patents, there is 189 2132 patented December 27th, 1932, named the Atomizing Attachment for Airplane Engine Exhausts. There's also the U.S. Patent 3608820, patented September 20th, 1971, named the Treatment of Atmospheric Conditions by Intermittent Dispensing of Materials Therein. Another one is patent number 3813875, patented June 4th, 1974, named Rocket Having Barium Release System to Create Ion Clouds in the Upper Atmosphere. And I'll finally bring your attention to a fourth patent, 4686605, August 11th, 1987, the method and apparatus for altering a region in the Earth's atmosphere, ionosphere, and magnetosphere. These are just four of the many patents that are out there related to aerosol springs. There is an active denial from all forms of government that any geoengineering is even going on. There are opinions that it is part of a depopulation agenda, and there are studies and people looking into it into what they call chemtrail residue that residue includes fungus and dead virus and there is also uh, people who suggest that there is a link between Morgellons disease and strange fibers found in this residue after a heavy spray there are also health concerns for people and the increase in um, respiratory diseases. After all, it cannot be helpful for people to be inhaling oxidized metals or possibly even experimental agents. So then we also get into the corporate agenda and the nefarious connection of Monsanto and the patents that Monsanto is filing and the GMO products that they're creating, including aluminum resistant crops. Is it a coincidence that aluminum is found in increasing amounts in our soil of areas that are experiencing heavy chemtrailing and Monsanto's patents? The political context is huge. First, who is doing the spraying? Is it a foreign military? Is it a rogue billionaire thinking that they're saving the world? We have a right to breathe clean air. We have a sovereign right to choose what we put inside our bodies. But when somebody is spraying the air that we all breathe, we lose that choice. And we cannot choose to stop breathing when someone is spraying the air. Imagine a world where you want to become more self-sufficient, but somehow the soil will no longer produce the food that you need. You need to rely on corporate genetically modified seeds that are engineered to grow in an aluminum, barium, and strontium saturated soil. These seeds are designed to be terminator seeds, thus eliminating the ability 
to reproduce the seed stock that farmers have relied on for hundreds of years. What if the plan is to make you reliant on a company to get your food and make it so that you will never be able to grow organic food again? That is a scary future for a free humanity, but a wonderful future for a few stockholders and CEOs. Mainstream media is corporate owned. So they are there to keep us buying stuff and in the consumer cycle. They are there to keep us misinformed and distracted from real issues. We don't hear about many issues in the mainstream news, like alternate energies being suppressed, technologies that can really free us from the corporate and government grid. Corporations own our government. If our elected officials step out of line, they lose funding and they lose their backing. Maybe we should be asking the elected representatives why they are not talking about this. Many people find it hard to believe that people would commit such destructive acts when they themselves would have to live with the consequences of these chemtrails. I know I found it hard to believe until I did my own research and started looking up into the sky, you know? So I ask you, next time you hear somebody talk about chemtrails, don't just dismiss them and look away. Look up. I think I have three main concerns with chemtrails, and that's uh, just transparency overall, government transparency, um, overall pollution, and uh, human health and animal health and life health. We have a thing called uh, the Weather Modification Information Act. Uh, it was created, I think, in 85. It was repealed by the BC government, I believe, in 2003 or just around that time. Um, it's called the Weather Modification Act. And the very interesting thing about it is that uh, it says it's an act to provide uh, an act to provide for the obtaining of information respecting the weather modification activities. And when you, we're not taught law, we're not taught how to read an act or a statute. It's an act that they created in which um, governs the modification of weather. And in it, the, one of the first things you do is you read the Interpretation Act, or the Interpretation or the Definition section, because um, that defines the words in which you're going to be reading, because words can have different meaning. So, for example, it says, weather modification activity includes any action designed or intended to produce a physical or chemical means, changes in the composition or dynamics of the atmosphere for the purpose of increasing, decreasing, or redistributing precipitation, decreasing or suppressing hail or lightning or dissipating fog or cloud. So we can clearly see that this intent is to manipulate the weather. I know that... <laughs> I think it's pretty safe to say that uh, governments in general, the state in general, has been the most genocidal factor in all of human history. They've killed the most people ever. So the fact that they, not to say they're doing this, but to think that they avoid the, the uh, conversation at all will um, and keep you entertained tells you something. So what we have is we have a chain of disinformation that is spread through uh, the many means in which we get our information from. And the predominant way we get our information from is the mainstream media, television, Hollywood, and the newspaper. So um, nowadays, because of the freedom of, of, of the internet and, and the information that's out there, we're living in a very precise time in which we can actually dig for ourselves and not just swallow what we're, what we're fed by the corporate media, the mainstream media, and even government state-sponsored spo state sponsored propaganda. Well, they say that geoengineering is uh, little particles spread into the sky to reflect the sun's light. And one example I have is a, is a, a company called Weather Modification Incorporated. They're based out of Fargo, North Dakota. Um, pretty reputable company. They've done lo lots of work with tons of different clients, public, private, uh, on their website. Um, they say they're, uh, they're a proven success of water, water, weather modification uh, in atmospheric and weather operations. Um, and it says their reputation speaks for themselves, so they know exactly what they're doing. They specialize in uh, meteorolo meteorological services, atmospheric assessments and evaluation, cloud seeding, weather radar systems, environment monitoring, and aircraft. Uh, some of their past clients have been, in fact, Alberta Hail Suppression Project. 
the British Columbia Forest Ministry of Forest, British Columbia Hydro and Power Authority, and this company specializes in exactly weather modification services. So most people don't know about this weather modification. Uh, the question remains is why aren't we getting a say on this and why aren't we being told about this? Um, I don't. I don't consent to this. I don't agree to it. I don't agree to spraying whatever it is in the sky, whether it's to save my children or to hurt my children. I don't agree to anybody doing this. This stuff is having a massive impact on our health, on our water supply, on our soil, on our trees, on everything that we could possibly imagine. And this is all the stuff that's supposed to keep us going for the next hundreds of thousands of years, next generations. Well, people are starting to realize what's going on simply because they're doing their homework, um, because um, they're asking questions and they're not getting answers and that's the first telltale sign that something's wrong and that there's some kind of deception going on. Uh, we all know it, we're all human and we all understand that when someone's trying to hide something they cower away and they don't talk about it, they're not open about it because there's something to hide, that's obvious. Um, people are starting to wake up People of all sorts are waking up to this and they're not happy about it. They do not consent to it. I do not consent to it. And I think the polls, the election polls, are clearly showing that a lot of people aren't consenting to what's going on overall. So I think at the end of the day, um, things are changing. Um, people are really starting to wake up and seeing what chemtrails really are and, and making up their own mind um, and trying everything they can to talk to their friends and talk about it because talking about it is healthy. Suppressing stuff is not healthy. Well, I feel that most issues that are critical to our survival on this planet are dealt with by the consumer uh, corporate interest in this. And they hire lobbyists or they get lawyers to do an inquiry into this and that. But what we need right now is we need some uh, transparency and we need to know what the agenda of the people doing this is and why. And if they're using the excuse that we have to protect the people from exposure to extreme UV radiation and that so, uh, so forth, we deserve an explanation. We need to know what is at stake here and what the facts are on what this stuff is doing to us. You know, we can assume that Unless the community pulls together, recognizes, and deals with this, um, we're going to be suffering consequences from unseen dangers for a long time to come. I have quite an interest in what's flying over us. And looking southeast out of my apartment window, I have seen on occasion these grids being formed. And it's not like airplanes flying to a destination. It's like a deliberate grid part pattern being laid out. And then the um, trails dispersing to form that kind of cover. Now, they say that it may cause as much as a 20% dimming in the sun's radiation on us, which is another big factor. Our health is it, a major concern here. Because I think all things are connected. And whether you're a native or... Um, whatever faith you have, we are meant to be stewards and to look after our brothers and sisters and generations to come. There is no justification for this kind of, I think it's an evil perpetration. I think people should be charged not only with crimes against humanity, but it's really, uh, it ranks with the immoral behavior behind World War II. But we have to pull together and identify the environment is our economy, it is our health, it is our future, it's the future of children. We have to have the perspective of the older people as well, and the native people, who can give us understanding to how we can, what our priorities are. In the past we've survived. This is World War III. This is what we're dealing with.